Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello. Good morning, Liza and Dikran, and good evening to Laura, Fegao, and Hasib, and Muhammad Server. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello, Hi. everyone. Hi. I hope everyone uh, can listen to me and the video is clear. Yes. Yes, yes no problem. Yeah, thank you so much to all of the panelists for joining us today for this panel discussion on um, celebrating, commemorating Peer Review Week 2023. Um, like always, since the beginning of Peer Review Week, Asian Council of Science Editor has been contributing its role in developing awareness and uh, um, transforming the content and resources of Peer Review Week as one of the steering committee member. And and uh, today's uh, discussion, this time, this is the very first time when we call an inclusive cabinet of industry experts to talk on peer review week theme. So the uh, purpose of today's panel discussion inviting only the experts, not the attendees, is so that we can have something concluding at uh, after having one and a half hour discussion with each other. So today's panel discussion is about on the topic peer review and the future of publishing trends and production by the industry experts. Today, um, this panel discussion is hosted on the platform of Asian Council of Science Editors, and we have called upon um, a total of six industry experts, including uh, Dikran Trouser, Senior Director, Publication Management, Mark USA. We have Laura Dormer with us, a, a co-founder and editorial director, Bikars Publishing UK. We have Muhammad Sarwar with us, Secretary and Prior of Asian Council of Science Editors. Um, another panelist, we have Liza Ditora with us, for a Director of STEM Writing, Hofstra University, New York. We have Hasib Irfanullah, an independent consultant from Bangladesh and also advisory cabinet member of Asian Council of Science Editors. And lastly, we have Fei Gao, senior scientific editor, Geoscience Frontiers China. And at the last, I would like to introduce myself as moderator of today's panel discussion, Mariam Sayab, director of communication, Asian Council of Science Editors. So thank you once again to all of the experts for joining us today. And I hope that with this panel discussion, uh, hopefully after concluding this whole session from ACSA platform, we will surely contribute some concluding points to Peer Review Week 2023. So very first, I would like to invite Dikran to share his opinion on Peer Review Week theme of 2023. Great. Thanks very much, Mariam. You can... You can hear me fine. Am I yes. coming? Great, great. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm honoured to be uh, in everyone's company here. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for, for the invite. Uh, so obviously peer review is crucial um, and um, and it's crucial in, in both the industry and, and academia. Um, so my, my background is um, I was uh, in academia for about uh, 18 years and I've been in industry for about 20 years. Um, and, uh, and 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 throughout that process, an efficient and significant uh, peer review has been central to everything that I've done. Uh, everything that I've done in my uh, career has been uh, publication focused. Um, and um, and 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 my interest in uh, peer review is that uh, it is at the moment the gold standard to uh, really validate our research. Uh, to really pull out any errors uh, that could be in the research by exposing it to uh, expert uh, removal uh, of a certain amount of, of bias. Um, you know, we all really have bias, uh, but uh, exposing the uh, your work to to the peer reviewers is uh, one way of removing the bias and uh, and and, uh, and leading to improvements in the final publication. Um, 
there are pain points. Uh, we all know the pain points, um, and uh, I've, I've, I call our peer review as a gold standard, but uh, I've had colleagues that call it the bronze standard, right? Uh, it's not really uh, necessarily the, the, the gold standard in all cases. And when we're uh, stressed with slow, long publication uh, cycles uh, in which uh, peer review takes an extended amount of time, peer review takes time, uh, then, um, you know, that's a bottleneck. Um, so efficiency suffers. Um, increasing uh, diversity and inclusivity in the pre-review process. Uh, it's getting better, uh, but it has not always been that way. Uh, and we have a long way to go. I know we have experts on this panel. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, to hearing about that. Um, um, over stringent, stringent gatekeeping. You know, when I uh, submitted my uh, my papers um, on, for my PhD, we had a little bit of that. You know, <laughs> we know the the stories. Uh, we're not all Einstein's, but even Einstein's papers, uh, I believe, were rejected. Right. So, uh, and there's so many. Even the DNA structure was re rejected uh, initially. So, over stringent gatekeeping is an issue. Um, so what we need to do is really um, to uh, address all those uh, uh, bottlenecks, and there are many more, uh, and continuously evaluate in forums like this, and also in an extended um, um, in an extended uh, audience, uh, so that we can come up with ways to um, to tackle uh, some of these issues. Technology is an obvious example. Uh, experts such as these uh, are obvious examples. There are uh, probably uh, many years of uh, experience in this panel. So I'm looking forward to what everyone has to say, um, to discussing these items um, with everybody here. Incentives, uh, a hot button issue for reviewers uh, are also very important. So uh, so um, th thank you, thank you very much for, uh, for, for including me in this. Great, I think, I think I'm next. Um, yes. Shall I, shall I go ahead? Great. Well, thanks. Hi, everyone. It's nice to nice to be with you today. As as Dickrin said, I'm I'm really pleased to have been invited to be be part of this group. Um, as Mariam introduced, I'm um, editor or director um, at Bakaris Publishing. But I think possibly more more pertinently, I've been a journal editor um, for the past twenty years. Um, and within that time, have been involved in in managing the the peer review process. Um, and certainly, I can say that. Um, Although peer review has seen some evolution over that 20 year period, perhaps not quite so much as, as some of the other areas of the publishing workflow, um, you know, from the editor's perspective, where we've seen sort of the impact of, of digitization, whereas peer review, I think, feels like there has been some evolution, but perhaps um, not as much as there, there could or perhaps should have been. Um, the other thing I can I can also say for absolute certain is that the peer review process has become increasingly challenging um, from the editor's perspective and I think from everyone's perspective um, in the time that I've been working on it. Um, when I first started um, managing the peer review process for the journals that I worked on when I began in 2003, I was working um, within um, some cardiovascular journals and, uh, and infectious disease journals. Um, it was reasonably easy. Um, I didn't think it at the time, but looking back now, it was reasonably easy to, to secure reviewers um, with the relevant expertise um, for them to be able to send their feedback back to me in a timely manner, or at least it, it felt that way because they generally met their, met their deadlines. Um, that is is sadly no longer the case. Um, and the result of that is that papers are taking much longer to pass through the process, as, as Dickren mentioned. Um, it's taking more editorial resource um, from my perspective in terms of the time being spent managing that process. Uh, the time and the effort um, from the editors, again, just from my perspective, I know it's the same for everybody as well. Um, and I think probably more importantly, the burden is being felt very strongly by the people that are being asked to, to complete those reviews. Um, and this has an impact, I think, on, on all stakeholders in the research process, up to and including uh, the patients who are ultimately affected by this research, whether it's being incorporated into health policy, whether it's being other researchers being able to build on the work um, by slowing that up, we're slowing down that whole process, which which is is not a good thing, um, and I you know I agree with Dickren. I think there is um, there's a need currently, and I think for, for the time being at least there is the need for human oversight of that quality assurance process um, of the research that we're putting out and publishing in our journals. Um, but I do also think that there are some great opportunities now to 
to leverage some of the technologies that are coming out to help. Um, again, when I first started in 2003, we didn't have things like, um, well, certainly my company didn't have plagiarism detection software that we use now, you know, pretty much as standard. Um, and I'm absolutely certain I sent out papers to reviewers that that were probably plagiarized. We probably even, you know, got as far as publishing some of them if it just so happened that nobody noticed before before the papers were put out there. And those papers would now and, and could have been then screened out at that point um, of submission and save the reviewers the effort and the time um, that they spent looking at them. And I think in a similar way, there are tools that are starting to become available now that we'll be able to use to streamline that process um, which I'm sure we'll come on to uh, in our later chats, um, that can help reduce the editorial burden, the reviewer burden, and, and speed everything up. Um, and I think as well, um, there are opportunities to better incentivize and reward reviewers. And I also think to widen the pool of reviewers that we work with as journals. So that obviously both relieves the burden, but I think probably more importantly, it improves the diversity of the feedback and, and the opinion that we're getting, um, and maybe addresses some of those um, uh, problems that you see in maybe very innovative work um, getting getting blocked early on. Um, so yes, I'm really looking forward to to discussing this with everyone um, and seeing what everyone else has to say. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Yes, uh, it's my turn now. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me today to share my thoughts on uh, Peer Review Week 2023. Uh, I'm really very happy to see that Asian Council of Science Editor is uh, doing a great job uh, to fulfilling its mission of advancing the scholarly publishing community in Asia. Uh, now, considering the rapid changes in the AI world, this year's theme of peer review week is really very interesting, but at the same time, uh, it's very critical and uh, sensitive to talk about. First, I would like to focus on the role of policymakers in shaping and advancing the whole peer review process. And if, we, if I say that not only whole, but from submission to publication, this is the whole process. Uh, we should uh, see uh, the role of policymakers uh, other than peer review also. If we look around, it's uh, obvious that scholarly communities today are uh, adopting artificial uh, intelligence to streamline various aspects of the research and publishing ecosystem, like manuscript submission, uh, like initial screening, uh, conflict of interest, and much more. So the first question here is, how we can utilize AI's potential to enhance the efficiency and productivity of the current peer review process, but without compromising the quality and integrity of research data, along with other misconduct issues? As we all know, policymakers are the real backbone of academia and the publishing ecosystem too. But I think so, uh, the real policymakers are uh, the persons who are shaping the uh, new world for us. They are very important. So if we want to instigate changes, update systems, and develop and implement new frameworks, that can impact how peer review operates in the digital age, we definitely need the policymakers to take the lead. However, while we leverage AI to expedite peer review, we also have to look into the associated ethical considerations. That again gets the policymakers on the front line to ensure that guidelines and workflows are in place to uphold standards of research integrity. At the end, I think this whole process involves confirmation of transparency, fairness, and bias mitigation, as well as we need to focus on capacity building program, implementing hand-on training related to the use of artificial intelligence in research and publishing for early career and expert reviewers as well as the editorial management team to get maximum benefits of AI tools and solutions. Thank you. Thank you once again. 
uh, to the Asian Council of Science editors to give me this opportunity to join this great panel discussion. Thank you. Next turn is for Liza. Oh, hello, thank you very much for including me on the panel for such an important topic. I'm honored to be here. And it's always very quite humbling to think about addressing a group like this of people who do so much really important work. So the things that I wanted to talk about today have to do a little bit with building and sustaining a pipeline of diverse peer reviewers and supporting authors from diverse backgrounds. Now, um, so Dickren and Laura started out by explaining a little bit about their background. Now, I'm a transdisciplinary scholar, so I'm currently in academia. I spent a, a chunk of my career in industry where I work not just on publications, but also in the um, area of regulatory documentation. But my last publication came out in this book. I don't know if we can see it, but it's a culturally centered and intersectional approach to reproductive justice globally. So I also recently... Um, uh, we sent in a book, we're talking about um, different um, representations of um, gender and embodiment in popular culture. So it's kind of a lot of different things. And I was like, if you can capture some of these diverse uh, ways of thinking about peer review and scholarship, that that could enrich the um, the scientific realm. So one of the things that I do a lot of peer review in is um, rhetoric of health and medicine and technical communication. And we do peer review that's often a little bit more developmental. So you're kind of working with the author to identify. So, so what's the value that's in this paper and what could be forwarded as opposed to just like, oh, this is quite bad. So you don't really want that to be the message necessarily that you're sending if you're trying to build diversity and get new voices into the conversation. So my questions are about how do we build and sustain a pipeline of diverse peer reviewers and how do we support authors from diverse backgrounds? Because you need to be an author before you can be a peer reviewer. So by fostering that, you're able to foster this pipeline of peer review and peer reviewers and potentially journal editors. So if I think about the diversity, we could be thinking about race, gender, nationality, religion, or it could include backgrounds such as patients or caregivers, or we could think about expertise like coverage from different scientific areas, people from the humanities, um, and even language or regulatory expertise or expertise in statistical matters. All of these are areas, or, or policy actually, um, as Dr. Starward just pointed out, these are all areas that could enrich the peer review. So I put together a short list of um, components. So I wanted to talk a little bit, so that book that I just showed talks about culture-centered approaches. This is a health communication concept that was theorized by someone named Mohan Duda, who is currently a New Zealand-based researcher, but his work focuses on BIPOC people, and it's almost entirely work with people in the global South. And the main concept is that before you communicate, you go to the community first and find out those concerns, and then you develop a study. So you're not being culturally competent or culturally sensitive and like delivering your message. What you're doing is finding out what message is needed in that area or what health gap is in that area first, and then you plan to meet those gaps. I also think it's important when we consider the digital age to think about access, education, infrastructure, and literacy. So it's great that we're in a digital age, but we are serving communities of people who can't afford things like shoes. So it's like, how do you bridge those kinds of gaps? Because I think those are serious gaps. So we can kind of think about how do we increase access to education, to digital media, to the infrastructure that people need, to electricity, to electronic devices. So um, Dr. Farah Asif made this comment on our recent good publication practice for company-sponsored research that came out in Annals of Internal Medicine, that you can't expand inclusivity in publications until you expand inclusivity in education. And we need to be thinking about how those could be made available to people as well. So if people lack access to the internet, how else can they get access to this information or these systems? And then I guess that goes counter to some of the needs for efficiency that we have in an industry setting. And then finally, just a couple words about cultural and narrative humility. 
and this comes out of health humanities and narrative medicine. There's a core paper by Sayantani Dasgupta that came out in Lancet in 2008. But the idea here is to replace the idea of competence and put in the idea of humility, the idea that we can never fully understand the perspective or experience of another. And consequently, we need to listen to that. So those are the main ideas that I had. And I think I'm out of time. So I will thank you all for your kind attention. Now, next turn is for uh, Hasib. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me on this panel. Uh, I would like to come from a different direction. Since uh, this year's topic is about future, uh, I think the way we see the human, if I may call it human dependent peer review, it is, it is not good. It is not doing good. It is inequitable. It is unsustainable and it is suffering from injustice. And we have talked about a few examples over the last 22 minutes. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see and I'm trying to advocate for a world where we have moved from 100% human dependent peer review to 100% AI dependent peer review system. Because for example, we say that peer reviewer, they do peer reviewing because it is academic responsibility. There is a demand for that. But are we acknowledging uh, their responsibility or their performance in their promotion appointment you know, tenure? You, you name how many universities out of 1,800 uh, universities which have been ranked by uh, Times uh, Higher Education, they are actually considering peer review. We often say that peer review is a good karma because I don't know someone, they are doing good to me, uh, they are reviewing my paper, and I'm doing the same thing for them. So it is a kind of a reciprocate each other. But I have been struggling as I'm associated with different uh, uh, journals and I have uh, 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 friends, editor friends. People who published, authors who have published in our journal, they are declining to become reviewer. Just, you know, so reciprocation doesn't, doesn't make sense. Uh, the, the other point I would like to say that there is a controversy regarding paying reviewer. There has been a, a calculation that the thousand millions of hours peer reviewers they spend, if you calculate just taking UK, USA, and China, the whole amount per year would be $2.5 billion. Amazing figure. You may say it is exaggeration, but it is not. The whole calculation is there. But when we say, hey, let us pay the peer reviewers, no, we can't because it is it will add bureaucracy, it will be exorbitant cost to be added, conflict of interest. We we use so many excuses. And we also say that it will create uh, or uh, expand the gap between North and South because of that extra burden of peer review payment. But we are not doing uh, too, so good regarding uh, reducing that gap. For example, in open access, APC, what we have been doing to reduce the gap. So my proposition is we have to take strong steps. I can explain it later on so that we can have phases where we make the shift from 100% human dependent to 100% AI dependent. The technology is not there yet, but the progress is happening. And uh, Dr. Sarwar actually mentioned a couple of points on that. So my final point is, while making that transition, we need to think of not only investing in technology development only, but also investing in human system development so that we, the users, the stakeholders, the actor, are ready to adopt it. Otherwise, the whole publishing industry is bombarded with innovation. Oh my goodness. Uh, but adoption is scaling up. We see some lacking there. So I should stop now. I can, I can uh, share some light on uh, the phases later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Haseeb, uh, for sharing your opinion. Uh, and the last person to share their opinion is Fei Gao from Geoscience Frontiers. Uh, so everyone, good evening. So it's really good to help me engage in this uh, panel discussions with a lot of the diversities as we were from the, we will have the different, the, the culture diversity, we will have, we will have the, all the academic and uh, also the industry diversities. 
So I think I've been followed the theme of the peer review week in the couple in the last couple weeks years. I I think it 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 is really great that is is changing from the details part of the peer review process to, to what we we are going to change or what's the future of the 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 not only the peer review but also the the future of the publishing. So I'm really interested in the theme of this year. And I think just, uh, so in fact, we we all know that the, the peer review, uh, the future of that and the future of the publishing are closely uh, intertwined uh, as peer review is no problem, a key factor that is to could influence the quality, not only the quality, the or also the impact of the scholarly publication. Uh, and uh, as the, the 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 publishing landscape is changing rapidly in the last couple of the, in the last decades, uh, the new technologies, the platforms, and the models uh, emerge and the change the ways we just uh, accessing the research outputs and the distribution the research uh, outputs. And uh, uh, frankly speaking, we uh, we have to admit. The, the peer review now faces many challenges and the limitations, which hider its uh, efficiency and uh, effectiveness. Which uh, it, the first is the is uh, the ethical issues and the misconduct in the peer review, and the second is to also include also just uh, in including that that's the lack of the transparency in the peer review and the accountabilities. And, and also that is the, when I was working in the journal in the last 10 years, to, um, we are facing the lot of the problem, the, 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 the big problem is that, that is the lack of the enough participation and the recognitions from our scholars, from the, our just uh, the researchers or the, even the students. So I think uh, among all these the challenges and the limitations, um, we have to see that the, we need to do some adopt and evolve uh, about some of the, the innovations that, that keep up with the changes to, for the whole academic or the scholarly publishing industry and the meets the, to meet the needs and the expectations of the research community and the society at large. So I think this panel discussion, I heard that all the experts you're talking about the artificial intelligence, the, the integrity, the trust, and the, also the cultural diversity in the peer review. But I think one point I would like to discuss is that that is the peer review recognition and the reward system, uh, which is the fundamental of we how we can engage with our just the research communities and the lots of the scholars, but that is also the parts that we were losing uh, in these days in the peer review. So the, thank you so much again to help me in this panel discussions. And uh, yes, I think we, I, I, I can't believe now that that's the, we will have some, some insights to this uh, interesting topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Figaro, and all of the panelists for um, sharing their opinion on uh, the topic of panel discussion. And um, honestly, each opinion needs a total debate and how we can incorporate it into the peer review system. So let's move towards uh, some quick questions for each panelist. Uh, my first question is for Dekran, uh, for you. Um, can you elaborate on the emerging opportunities you see for improving the peer review process in digital era? And additionally, how can we navigate an unintended consequences that may arise as we implement changes to address these challenges? Uh, Dekrin, can you please unmute yourself? so that I can hear the answer. All right, this should go through, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mariam. Uh, so there are uh, a lot of opportunities uh, that are 
rapidly becoming mandatory uh, and uh, they're mandatory in, in peer review process and, and actually uh, they're probably mandatory in everyday life uh, so you, we need to keep up with them um, mandatory for me uh, and a lot of the people that i've worked with um, is human oversight right human oversight so uh the peer review process uh, needs that at the moment. And uh, as we develop, uh, my view of it is that human oversight is going to be uh, continuing uh, to be an import important aspect. Um, uh, you know, one thing that comes to mind, uh, just trying to relate various uh, regions that, that, are, that I've worked with in my past and in the present is that uh, as these opportunities uh, become available, uh, our excitement uh, do sometimes need to knee-jerk reactions. Um, I saw that during uh, the sequencing uh, revolution with uh, with DNA. Uh, if you sequence DNA, every single disease was going to be solved. No, it's not. Uh, so, uh, and it won't be. And we'll sequence, we'll map, uh, and we'll do a bunch of stuff. Uh, so we'll still be there. Uh, that's one thing that, uh, that, that, that is uh, important. So I would... Uh, in terms of the opportunities divided into a baseline improvement uh, that is not necessarily in peer review, but does affect peer review. Baseline is the incredible process, um, uh, progress in, in the tech side that we need to take advantage of um, 100%. And, uh, and and pull it in uh, for, for peer review. And that has taken our peer review in my lifetime, in my career, which um, I like to think is not that long, <laughs> but I'm counting the years. Uh, it goes from uh, having a stack of papers I was sending in uh, at, you know, during my postdoc um, for peer review to now press the button and it goes there instantly. Uh, hopefully that will also open up a bunch of stuff uh, like uh, incorporating a diversity of uh, peer review, uh, a diversity of authorship, because that press of a button doesn't just go down the road as it did uh, with my whole stack uh, with UPS uh, at, uh, in the US. It goes all over the world. It goes to New Zealand, to academics there that are uh, are making incredible contributions. Uh, some of the other stuff uh, is also uh, at the cutting edge. Uh, some of this is the stuff that is um, uh, getting us really excited. Uh, the generative options um, that that are uh, you know th that are making us uh, scramble to put guidelines together, or press buttons for um, uh, you know to to answer the questions: Who wrote this? Right. Uh, so so baseline and cutting edge stuff. Um, layered on top of all of that, uh, as Lisa mentioned, uh, is uh, stuff that we visit. Uh, we can't necessarily visit in uh, depth, um, uh, but we try to uh, in things like good, pub good publication practice. Um, and and, and, uh, and, and, and we, we, we kind of touched on peer review there, uh, but uh, things we can't go necessarily in depth into are things like speed. Right, speed is going to be important, uh, and um, the more speed, the more mistakes. Uh, when humans are involved, the more we need AI, uh, and, and uh, it's going to help us, uh, as it always has, uh, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, we benefit from it. It's a double-edged sword. Um, uh, we, we will be able to uh, really pull aside items uh, that may not have kept to uh, existing guidelines and have gaps that um, that that uh, we can't necessarily catch when only the human is involved. Uh, you know, cheers guidelines, uh, consort, uh, all that stuff can be caught. Uh, and then with human oversight, uh, we can pull the standard um, uh, a, a little bit higher. Uh, so the obviously the most exciting opportunity uh, um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, because uh, humans are important, but we don't really evolve that fast, right? AI does. AI evolves very fast. And uh, so uh, getting the artificial intelligence to assist us uh, is going to be a, a major opportunity for not necessarily the ground, always the ground groundbreaking uh, opportunity, but for, for quality control, uh, for quality control, you know, um, 
perhaps the peer review that, that, that I do at the end of a really, really long week, week uh, you know, could be helped by, uh, by, by items uh, that, that are, uh, that, that can be provided by quality control. And that was uh, the case, uh, actually, if I can call AI uh, uh, as, as a helping hand in, um, in even, uh, even documenting the references at the end of my manuscripts, right? I was using AI then in EndNotes. It's the same sort of thing on a stratospheric level. Um, I used to be an EndNote uh, uh, expert, um, and that was a, like a revolution to save uh, five or six hours of my life when that came uh, across. I think in peer review, that's going to still be the case um, uh, for with the um, with with the AI revolution. I think that some of the bias and discrimination will be because AI is actually going to draw on the stuff that we put um, uh, at the moment uh, into the net. Uh, so the so some of the bias is built in. It's going to take us to unbuild it out of the existing AI tools. Um, so that's uh, that's another thing. Um, some of the AI can help with privacy and anonymity. I know we're all, uh, you know open concept, and we like to think that there is no uh, unintended consequence uh, when we just open up and do everything in public. But there's a there's a positive side to privacy uh, to to sort of uh, take some of the pressure off. Um, so, so that's also important. And uh, I think it was um, it was actually um, handled a little bit earlier on. There are barriers. Um, you know what I have in front of me. I, I can't expect uh, everybody in the world. I'm so lucky to to be looking at the facilities that I have to have the same facilities everywhere. We must do our best. For those facilities to end up everywhere, but there is a scoping. There is a uh, at the moment that's a big challenge. Uh, so uh, hopefully um, uh, some of that will be solved, uh, and the more it gets solved, the more we'll be able to uh, include people um, from uh, from all over the world. Uh, so I feel like I should touch on unintended consequences um, a little bit more. Um, I think that. Um, Unintended consequence consequence could be uh, uh, the the big one here is uh, not prioritizing. Uh, we still have to prioritize ethics. We still have to prioritize humans. We still have to prioritize um, those items at the top, and uh, try to pull through uh, the flexibility, adaptability that is brought in by AI into the human experience. That's um, uh, so um, hopefully the unintended consequence will be right size so that um, it doesn't affect things too. I think that um, unintended consequence consequence could be uh, uh, the the big one here is uh, not prioritizing. Uh, we still have to prioritize ethics. We still have to prioritize humans. We still have to prioritize um, those items at the top and uh, try to pull through uh, the flexibility, adaptability that is brought in by AI into the human experience. That's, um, uh, so um, hopefully the unintended consequence will be right size so that um, it doesn't affect things too much. But I'm gonna stop there in case I'm, uh, I'm rambling. Th thank you very much. Thank you so much, Declan, for answering the question. Um, you have compiled all of the points in um, um, the shortest possible time. My next question is for uh, Laura Dormer, uh, considering the opinion. Uh, while addressing the challenges of the current peer review system, could you elaborate on how these new AI technologies can be sensibly integrated into the peer review process? Uh, while ensuring the preservation of human oversight where necessary. Also, what specific technologies or innovation do you see as a particularly promising or for improving the effic efficiency of peer review? Yeah, thanks, Mariam. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, building on what I said um, in, in the introduction, um, talking about the plagiarism tools, I think there are some points within um, the editorial workflow, um, and I think and Dickman touched on this as well, um, that sort of really uh, are open, I think, to, to huge improvement um, by um, 
making use of these new technologies that are coming out. So um, obviously, you know, as we all know, one of the first things uh, when a paper is submitted, there's quite a few technical checks that the editor will do um, before a paper goes out externally for further further review. Um, you know, we check it for suitability in the office. Um, and I think this is a process that's really ripe for, for automation. Um, a lot of what we're doing is, you know, we work through checklists, um, uh, much like Dick and I, I do like a, a, a spreadsheet and a checklist. Um, but I do think that AI can be utilized to do a lot of those sort of checks. So, you know, when I'm receiving a paper, I'm looking at things like, um, is the manuscript within scope for my journal? So how current the topic is, um, down to sort of more technical checks. So looking at the article format, looking at does it have the appropriate disclosures, the ethical information, is um, the referencing um, effective? And um, I'm thinking, you know, more from more building more from the point of just is the are the references correctly formatted to are they actually the correct references for what is being um what is being stated um all sorts of things and i think there are tools already available um i think there's one that's called penelope ai um that is being used for this already by by some journals um there's also journals um uh, tools rather um there's one that i know called size score that looks at the paper's methodology um, and there are tools used used for looking at um, clicking statistics, which are areas that can be quite challenging sometimes to get appropriate uh, um, external reviewers with the re relevant expertise to look at for us. Um, all of these things might be used um, even before submission, perhaps by authors um, to uh, improve on the, uh, the the work before it's even submitted. But as I, as I'm sure we'll be discussed later, that puts in some barriers um, <clears throat> for people that don't have access to them. And again, that's going to be a, a real problem, I think, because a lot of these tools are, are proprietary. They're not open source um, and uh, not all publishers and certainly not all individuals are going to have access to them, um, certainly not in the short term. Um, but they can also then yeah, be used by editors um, to check all these things before we uh, even, even start bothering uh, reviewers. Um, there's tools that I've already used uh, within systems, uh, submission systems that help identify suitable reviewers. So Web of Science's uh, reviewer locator is, is the very popular one used by journals um, to match up papers with appropriate reviewers. That's pretty widely used already. Um, I think there's also tools that, that can be helpful. Again, they can be helpful before the submission process in terms of uh, improving the writing style and um, helping with language. Um, so translation, I think, is a, is an area that's going to be really, really helped by by AI. Um, but I think that could also help improve the quality of the peer review reports in terms of the written quality. Some of the reports that I receive in um, are quite um, uh, difficult to 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 utilize because of of the the language uh, quality within them. But I think also that might help widen the pool of reviewers um, beyond you know approaching people that are fluent in English widening the pool um, more broadly to people um, from other geographic areas and not relying constantly on on expecting people to to review papers in English. Um, that's I mean, These are just things that are coming off the top of my head. So um, I think there's loads of technologies, loads of innovations that we're going to see coming out. And I think publishers are going to be bombarded with people wanting to give us demos of these great new tools that they can do. And here you could subscribe for a very small amount per year but there's going to be lots of them we're going to have to choose which ones are going to be the most useful we're going to have to look at our resourcing to do we have budget for these things um and that's just from um uh, publishers uh point of view before you even get into into um into individuals um so i think they can be sensibly introduced i think they'll probably be phased in uh, and the most sort of uh obviously useful ones will come in first and um the ones that we most quickly adopted will be the ones that we can integrate into the systems that we're already using. So things like plagiarism detection tools, the reviewer locator tool that I mentioned earlier, are embedded uh, within submission sites like Scholar One and um, Editorial Manager and things like that. And that makes it easy for them to be adopted. Um, I still, as, as I said at the beginning, think that there's that need for human oversight. But if we can get all of those technical checks, all those things out of the way um, beforehand, the human oversight then becomes a lot more about um, looking at how to improve the work, perhaps improve the clarity of the work, improve, um, uh, you know, look at areas that are a bit more um, uh, useful to have that human level of expertise um, without reviewers having to worry about any of that other stuff. Um, so yeah. <laughs>
Thank you, Laura, for sharing your thoughts uh, with us. Uh, my next question is for Mohammed Sarwar um, regarding uh, your perception uh, of introducing or involving policymakers in peer review. Uh, what specific policies, frameworks, or workflows do you believe that policymakers should prioritize to effectively harness AI solutions in peer review while ensuring transparency and fairness? Thank you, Miriam. As I am emphasizing the role of policymakers, uh, so I must say policymakers should prioritize policies for uh, AI ethics, transparency in AI algorithms, and standardized disclosure practices to harness AI in peer review while ensuring transparency and uh, fairness. Thank you so much for okay. summarizing the thoughts in the sh shortest possible uh, conveying points. Um, my next question is for Liza uh, regarding your perception of making more human um, involvement in peer review. Um, what specific strategies or initiatives do you believe are necessary to address the challenges of unequal access to education, digital media, and literacy practices? And how can these efforts help bridge the digital divide and ensure equitable participation in scholarly communication? Well, thank you for the thank you for the question. Um, so my first, it was interesting thinking about this because I'm like I should really exercise some cultural humility and some narrative humility here and say I don't think I should mandate what is needed in various locations and various regions. That what we need to do is to defer to the opinions of the people who would need to be included or those groups. So this isn't really a specific roadmap so much as the suggestion that we need to think about what are the specific obstacles to build and sustain a pipeline of diverse peer reviewers and authors. And then so for instance, in some locations, um, I, just ed I just edited a special issue of a journal and one of my colleagues wrote about the architecture of the Texas A&M University at Qatar and how that fostered inclusivity by creating spaces so that people could um, maintain religious observance and still have access to education. So kind of thinking about those things. So that's a very basic thing to think about, but even that small thing, it makes a difference as to who can attend school, which is becoming a more and more of a problem, I think in the region for some countries. So if I think about all the comments that are being made about artificial intelligence, there's a few things that have to do with inequity and unequal access. So there's a researcher at MIT called um, Joy Bulamwini, who has just actually recently published a fairly definitive study about this, and that AI not only replicates existing inequity and bias, but it amplifies it because AI is algorithmic. And what it's doing is always coming up with the most statistically probable answer. And therefore it just kind of reinforces a lot of different kinds of discrimination. So that's one thing to think about is that there needs to be interventions within the AI to get it to stop um, being quite as bad as it is. Also AI isn't capable to do evaluation of content because it's also, it's algorithmic. So when we're thinking about the affordances that Dr. Urfanula is talking about, it's like, oh, okay, so it's getting there. So what are the steps that these, these uh, researchers need to make? And that those are human steps. The human actor needs to be in charge of the AI. So that would be something to think about. Um, I was also at a meeting recently, I was at um, an anti-bias training because we're hiring and I was sitting with the biology department and I asked them what they thought because I was coming to this panel and they said that the biggest obstacle to publishing right now is page charges, that people cannot afford these page charges, that the page charges for open access are very, very high and that they're excluding researchers and that this is particularly a problem for people in these kind of middle income bands. So if you're extremely affluent and you're at a very well-resourced university, they can probably find $11,000 for you to put something into a nature journal. 
And if you're in a location where nature like waves the fee, then maybe you can get in, but it's creating a large middle band of people who are excluded. So that's another problem. So if we wanna think about what are some of the solutions potentially, the multi-regional clinical trial center at Harvard University has just, it's like a vast array of material, but they have a lot of content on YouTube and also on their website about how to increase access for various underrepresented groups. One initiative that they did is how to include more children in clinical trials and how to include children's voices. And this kind of follows, they're not trying to be culture centered, that's not language they would use, but they did go to children first and they included children in study design. And I was like, so as you're including children in study, maybe you can include them in peer review and sort of think about this kind of like ecosystem of research that it's starting with the voices of people and it's ending with the voices of people and that those voices, as we're doing things like improving artificial intelligence and we're better integrating artificial intelligence across this ecosystem to make sure all those voices are there. And then these are some very, very basic things, but a lot of the websites are really heavy, which means it's difficult to access it if you're in an area where the Wi-Fi isn't that great. So I recently did some peer review for the Rambam Maimonides Medical Journal, and it's a dual, it's India and Israel journal. And they were very, very flexible with the modalities for the peer review. They're like, well, we understand that maybe your Wi-Fi isn't that great and maybe our system isn't working. So they offered multiple options for me as a peer reviewer. And I was like, well, isn't that lovely? So that way they're making it. So if you're a researcher who only has access to the internet on Wednesday, you can still work with this. You can still download something and do it. And then just the last thing to think about is that like building infrastructure requires money. So granting bodies should be able to start thinking about providing unrestricted funds to people in various locations so that they can shore up the authentic gaps that need to be filled within their own pipelines. So if that gap is infrastructure, if that gap is architecture, if that gap is access to electronic devices, that they can make those decisions and be empowered to make those decisions. Oh, sorry, thank you, I'm done. Thank you, Liza. Um, my next question is for Hasib. Um, as you are advocating um, transition of whole peer review to uh, AI-assisted peer review, uh, could you elaborate on the specific uh, phases you propose to make this transition and how do you envision addressing the challenges and concerns associated with such a shift, especially regarding equity and fairness in the review process. Thank you, uh, Mariam. Uh, I have recently, uh, I have, have written an uh, article for the Scholarly Kitchen where I actually explain the whole thing and I hope it will be out next week uh, during the peer review week. So definitely we are in the first phase. I'm thinking of five phases very quickly. We are in the first phase. Even big publisher like Elsevier, it also it says categorically that don't use AI when you are editing or reviewing paper. So we are at no go uh, phase, first phase. The second phase, I think it would be the one actually Laura was mentioning that some basic things, uh, some initial checking, the transparency, integrity, the structure, uh, whether it is actually matching the scope of our journal, those things could be done by AI quite easily, as Laura mentioned. Uh, and uh, definitely after that, if it passes through the AI screening, it will go to the uh, human reviewer. Let me use those words, human reviewers, and the editors will be making decision based on the human reviewers. The third one is a bit leap, but there are some activities going on. Uh, in that third phase, I'm thinking that once the review comes from the human reviewers, AI will be able to uh, comment on that. There is a commentary. So what will be happening, and there are some models already exist, but it has got some certain level of consistency and accuracy. So the editor, he will be had or she will be having the uh, revised manuscript, the editor's, uh, the re human reverse comments and the note from the AI. So uh, they will be, the editors will be considering all these three, then making uh, his or her decision. That's the third phase. The fourth phase is, 
we will include AI reviewer along with human reviewer. So it is a kind of a joint thing. And uh, definitely the authors will be responding to both the reviewers. They have to treat the AI as a, as a, as a reviewer. And once the revised document comes in, uh, the editor will be making decision based on AIs as well as the human reviewers comments. And there are some tools available. If you just visit Research Advisor or you know some other neural network based uh, tools, these are there, but the accuracy level is quite good. And obviously the final one, we remove just the human bit from that and it will be all 100% uh, AI. But how to do that? How to reach to that? Uh, because uh, Laura also mentioned that we have to do it phase by phase. Exactly, that's the point I was trying to make. Because often we focus only on the technology. Uh, if I get chance, I may touch upon so many different ways of reviewing things. We have tools, approaches, some are quite contradictory. We talk about open, we talk about double blind, even triple blind you know, review or uh, triple anonymized uh, review system. So many things, but to keep it equitable, the transition, I believe we shouldn't give responsibility to individual publisher. There are fantastic, uh, very active publishing associations out there. I don't want to name uh, those names, but there are, including ours. So those publishing associations should come together because they have an interesting combination of big, medium, small, all sorts of organizations or publishing houses so that they can pool their resources as well as experience, as well as expertise and take make that transition. I would call it a rationally paced transition, not just making a huge leap without doing anything. But at the same time, we need to think of, as I mentioned in my opening remark, how our actors, how our countries, how our uh, geographical location, the, the, the researchers as well as the editors are based in, how they are adopting to that. We need to think of that human side as well, human system as well, as we are making the transition through uh, non-human or AI, AI side. So that's, that's the way I'm seeing the future. Thank you. Thank you, Haseeb. Uh, moving forward, my next question is for uh, Fei Gao. Um, as your opinion is based on uh, giving more and more recognition to reviewers in uh, the whole peer review system, now given the growing disparity between this um, supply and demand of peer reviewers, what strategies or innovations do you believe can help address this imbalance and maintain the quality of reviews? Also, how can we motivate or and recognize reviewers more effectively? Uh, thank you, Maureen. I think just uh, when we're talking about the imbalance between the supply and demands of the peer reviews, that is a tricky question because the, as the journal editors, we all know that is the, we have the loss of the hundreds of thousands of, of the submissions to, for each, each, each journal, but to, we really have the difficulty to identify the suitable reviewers. But they were from the same community as the authors and the reviewers. So they, were, they were exactly from the same uh, research community. So how can we lose enough of the reviewers? So I think, uh, so as I speak uh, in the beginning, that is the, so uh, because first we, we have something else is a good uh, option, but I think it's at least that they can be not only just rewarded uh, or just uh, uh, get the, the credits uh, from the journal. They they also need to get the enough credits from their institutions or universities, or or at least from their research communities. Uh, we all know that the people get the uh, get the reverse from uh, the publications that they published in the journal with the with the quality and in, impact. But uh, why don't why they so why don't they can have the similar just rewards based on their time to spending on those journals by reviewing the articles? Uh, so that is the uh, that's the probably the not the only 
thing we can do it from the journal side, but but from the institution, university, or the the policymaker side. Uh, so the second, as I think, just uh, as Laura mentioned before, that's the uh, from the journal side, uh, we can include recruit just um, uh, the peer reviewer, uh, peer reviewers, uh, in a more effective way by using the, 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 the online platform or the database uh, da databases or not uh, from uh, or the just uh, from our just uh, networks that can match them with the suitable pay, uh, suitable pay papers uh, based on their expertise and uh, availabilities. Uh, so that uh, or requires us of, uh, to build and establish more just uh, the system and the tools the, or the digitally. Uh, uh, I think that that will just uh, help us to 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 just uh, spend in a more efficient way to to track uh, the best or the reviewers for the journal. And also another thing I'm thinking about is to to get in more just an innovative peer review practice. Uh, so I think in these days we all noticed we have some just uh, innovations in the peer review practice, uh, like the, the, the open peer review, the, the, pre, uh, the post publication peer review. Uh, uh, I have experienced, uh, uh, so I got the rejection from a one peer reviewer and he said, this, uh, I'm not the expert uh, to this uh, paper just only in the methodology part, but I'm quite interested to evaluate it and assess the, the paper state data and the other parts. So uh, at that point, I'm thinking about is this, so maybe uh, we are not only need the peer review, only just one or two peer review for the articles in the process. We can, we can foster and build just more collaborated uh, way because we can do the like the step-by-step uh, -step peer review or we can just uh, establish that as the community uh, just a peer review we can we we can just review uh, the whole system that uh, introduced a more constructive dialogue among just uh, uh, the expert from the different uh, small subject area uh, and we can get them all uh, get together to evaluate and monitor this, uh, uh, the whole peer review process. Uh, and also, I think just uh, another way we can do is that it is the, like I mentioned, that so if we are introducing the step-by-step -step peer review process. So the first that we can uh, make it uh, more ob objective, probably by using the standardized criteria, uh, some guidelines or the checklist, uh, not only just to have the reviewers to evaluate to do, to evaluate the paper stress and weakness, and also can help uh, if we have the in-house editors or or, or associate editors, uh, they can also using that a standardized uh, the format to do the first step of the uh, peer review, and then we can move to the second uh, step that we can just uh, to search and find the more suitable experts uh, for the articles. So that is uh, what I'm thinking about. And uh, yeah, I'm looking for there's some more discussions later. Thank you. One last question before we move towards the conclusion. Um, this question is for Haseeb. As uh, you mentioned, um, we can shift um, the peer review process to complete AI. So during this transition, I agree with you that there are many factors that uh, we, if we consider as a laborious work for editors, for reviewers, we can sh loop in AI for that. But how do you perceive data falsification, data fabrication, and image manipulation that is sometime um, author did it intentionally and sometime it's an unintentional thing? So how do you perceive that AI can do? Because during peer review, I think the very least uh, and most important part is the uh, content um, recognition and the results authenticity that only a reviewer can do with experience. So how do we perceive AI in that aspect 
considering that the scope, plagiarism, each and everything, if we do with the AI tools, what's left in the plate for peer review? How do you perceive that with AI tools? Yeah, I don't want I don't want anything to uh, to be left for human reviewer to do. That's my ultimate goal. Just imagine hundreds of articles have been retracted. No AI reviewer actually reviewed those. So so what's the point? Because the whole system is so what you call it, so not corrupt. The corrupt will not be the right word so much manipulated by so many different stakeholders. Even the predatory journals, they are also the stakeholders, isn't it? Because you have to fight with them. So my point is, uh, there are lots of glitches, there are lots of gaps. Just think of what happened in the third week of March this year, the delisting of uh, uh, 50 journals, some are quite big, and $9 million loss was uh, will be experienced by Wiley. Just just imagine those numbers. I can't even count the zeros. How many zeros are there? So my point is, yes, there are certain issues, certain limitations. But as uh, Dr. Sarwar actually mentioned, and everybody actually mentioning it, uh, Dikran mentioned that the, the fast, the the way AI is moving. So we need to capitalize on that. Just think of. Uh, in terms of equity, in terms of uh, uh, un uh, unethical practices, unfairness, we are. How come APC actually changed the whole dynamism? Isn't it a kind of a? Uh, it hasn't it disturbed the whole system? We are talking about is uh, it is creating inequity so much, but its growth is not, is unstoppable. It means change can happen, but who is going to lead the change? That's the important thing. Peer reviewer, no way. As authors, they can't. So definitely it is publisher. So that's why I don't want, again, I don't want to bring in only individual publishers. I want to bring in uh, everybody uh, together. That's why I believe associations, publishers, associations, societies have a big role to play. They can't just harness, they can't just maintain the status quo. We have to talk about it. You have to start conversing. It is not like that you are doing it wrong. That's why I will not go and talk with you. We have to be open about it, that the change is needed, uh, but how to how to do it? Uh, because the peer review system, I just want to make this, this, this quick point. The peer review system is so diverse. Uh, Fei Gao was mentioning about a step-by-step, -step, isn't it? From proposal development until the end. We, we need peer reviewer there. In one hand, we are struggling to get peer reviewer. Now we are saying, let us give more work to the peer mm -hmm. reviewer. Isn't it? It's, it's a, we are talking about even preprint, we just mentioned it. Published, reviewed preprints. So how it is different from journals? No, it is not different from journals. Is it? Because when you review the preprint, preprint, you know, preprint, and you are printing it, you are publishing it. It is no longer preprint. So I don't get it. We are talking about diversity a lot. But we are not consolidating. That's the that's the problem because the whole sorry to sorry to say, uh, my I'm not from any publishing industry. I just a, I'm an observer. There are so many different entities working in this huge ten billion dollar business journal business. They have their own narrow mindset. They want to do something. That's why my last point. So many awards are being given. Uh, in uh, publishing industry nowadays, isn't it? Innovation Award. And I was just checking, uh, LPSP, they uh, shortlisted 29, and five of those were from peer review, innovation in peer review. Yes. We should stop peer uh, innovating and let us scale things up. Thank you. Thank you, Haseeb. Um, now, as we are about uh, having 10 to 12 minutes more for uh, the prescribed time for the panel discussion, let's have some uh, quick concluding remarks from e each panelist, and then we will conclude this panel discussion. Starting from Dekran, uh, how would you like to conclude today's panel discussion and the whole talk on peer review and the new AI solutions? And um, what would you like to add as your concluding statement to it? 
Great, thank you, Mariam. Uh, you know, just uh, really some wonderful insights uh, from everybody on the panel. Um, peer review is is a complex process. Uh, it is actually a modular process that um, depends on, on, on a number of uh, stakeholders and organizations. No single solution will, will solve it. There is no single solution. Yet all of the items that uh, people have talked about um, will pro probably be useful. Uh, but, but in my mind, I think of the peer review process as uh, being uh, an interaction between um, um, various uh, separate teams and individuals. And uh, there are frameworks that are out there. They've been around for uh, decades that can easily be pulled into um, to our current AR revolution. The Nexus Guide, for example, which talks about um, how to integrate teams. Uh, um, you know, teams being a team of authors, a uh, team of, of review reviewers, uh, the 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 um, the, the um, regulatory framework. So. Um, you know, the Nexus Guide is one way it could be done. It's a human thought out process. Um, and uh, it, it's 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 a, a way to that we can validate basic knowledge and uh, not necessarily sway too far uh, to a single solution. Uh, so all those increments that uh, we've discussed here, everything from uh, the way we uh, uh, give credit to reviewers, uh, to the way we uh, pull in AI to help us, uh, to the way we interact with, uh, you know, with it, with an academic uh, mindset that will push us, uh, uh, you know, um, to the uh, to the higher risk uh, options. Um, so all all those are are, are important, um, and, and I think uh, building all those in uh, will be the way the way to go. Um, just to uh, streamline the process, uh, you know, Nexus is actually derived uh, uh, from, from um, you know, the old uh, classical Scrum framework uh, that's uh, often used. Um, you know, build into there the human component, uh, reviewer recognition, reviewer training, diversifying the reviewer pool. These are separate items. Uh, they, they won't be solved by a computer. Please, uh, please note that, um, and uh, collaborating and interacting with uh, with our colleagues uh, in Dubai, uh, in Japan, in you know, I do that um, um, on a on a daily basis, um, and and utilizing technology and innovation to pull in and build in those um, those, as I said, I uh, you know, beating the drum here, those increments uh, that are actually seemingly in increments, but uh, if I think back. Uh, to my um, stacks of paper, they're actually a revolution uh, and, it, and it's come uh, pr pretty quickly. So interact with different disciplines uh, on this uh, composite process so that we can uh, push it uh, to, to, uh, to the higher level. That will be, uh, that will be my feedback. So th thank you. Thank you, Dekrin. Next, I would like to ask Laura to share her opinion as concluding remarks for today's panel discussion. Thank you, Maryam. Um, yeah, it's been a really great discussion. I think we could probably stay here for, for hours yet um, discussing this further. Um, I think, I guess, from my point of view, to sort of sum up what we've been talking about, I think there are definitely some really great opportunities with the new technologies. And I think it will be important to, to make use of that. Um, but I do also think it's important to improve how the human part of the process takes place, because I think there are ways that we can do that now as well. I think a lot of that comes down to to widening the reviewer pool um so geographically i think career stage getting more early career research is involved and i really liked what faye was saying about um, making the process a bit more collaborative i mean it's it's nice sometimes i have people that i invite to peer review ask if they can perhaps involve their their phd student in the process and it can become really useful for actually you know in terms of incentivizing it's really useful for them in terms of their um sort of knowledge development with the oversight of their supervisor you know and you know it makes it more of a a useful process on their point of view as well as as for the author um i think incentivizing reviewers is really important um i think i i would be delighted if institutions incentivized their researchers to peer review in the same way that they do incentivize them to publish um i'm sure i'd be inundated with people wanting wanting to review if it was it was you know it's it's, it's nice to be given a certificate showing that you've done peer review but who are you showing that certificate to what 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 happens to it after that um, 
the one thing that always sounds in my mind there is a slight notion note of caution on that is by incentivizing researchers to publish the end of that process that has has been things like paper mills and journals being submitted papers that are, are reproduced in a fraudulent manner if you were to incentivize peer review my worry would be that there'd be things that would happen uh in in that area that perhaps would be on the fraudulent side and so we would need to be mindful of how to do that in an appropriate way that we're not putting even more pressure on researchers you know there's a lot of pressure to publish um would there be equal stress added then to also now also do loads of peer review of papers um so making sure that that's done in a in a in an appropriate way um but i think certainly the system isn't working as well as it could do at the moment and there are things that are happening that we can do to improve it and there are things that will happen over the future that will improve it and there's also things that we can do now to improve it uh, so yeah I will, I will leave it there but yeah it's been a really really interesting discussion so thank you for including me thank you Laura uh next I would like to ask uh, Muhammad Sarwar for sharing um his uh, thoughts as a conclusion for this panel discussion the Uh, uh, thank you, Miriam. I am really happy uh, for uh, be a part of this great panel discussion. I'm really enjoying and uh, it's really very constructive. Uh, as I'm just focusing on policy maker's role, and I must say that uh, by recognizing the influential role of policy makers in advancing peer review and the potential of AI solutions, we can foster constructive dialogues that uh, propels peer review into an era uh, marked by increased effectiveness and transparency. Through platform like the Asian Council of Science Editors, we can bring together uh, policymakers, academics, and industry experts to shape the future of scholarly communication through informed decisions and strategic collaboration. I believe that by working together, uh, we may redefine a better future of peer review. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed Server, for sharing your opinion with us and concluding remarks. Um, and next, I would like to ask Leza to share how you conclude this um, topic of panel discussion. Okay, thank you again. So thank you again for including me in this really excellent panel discussion. Um, I feel like I learned a lot just by listening to the, the different points of view of the different participants. Um, so for me, I'm kind of ending with a few questions. And one question, if I'm advocating for like narrative humility, is that AI doesn't have any humility because it doesn't have these questions. So it's like, how do we build in these ideas to this um, uh, this this type of process? But as um, we were discussing this, I was like, well, we didn't talk very much about the preprint server. So you know, that's a way of getting different kinds of human content that then the AI could potentially work with. So then that's another potential avenue for some of this. So I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it before. And then just the last thing, and again, this is um, paralleling some of what, what Dr. Gao had to say, is that you can think about peer review itself as a process that's kind of fostering a community and fostering intellectual engagement. So when I think about the way that we approach peer review in the rhetoric of health space or in the technical communication space, it is a little bit more collaborative, but also like the communities are a little bit small. So you're kind of, you kind of can tell when you get this paper, it's like, oh, you know, this is a graduate student who's trying to write something for the first time. It's like, what can I do to foster this particular work? And then you have, like the kinds of relationships that I have with the book and journal editors in those spaces are quite different than some of the relationships that I have with the editors and the, uh, um, the peer reviewers or the authors in a more scientific space. So kind of thinking about the possibilities for different sorts of communities. And then 
just the last thing that I would end with is that even as I'm saying, oh, the communities are a little bit different in science. I did a lot of work for a while when I was in vaccines, I was working on pathogenic Neisseria and that was a very small community. And it did start to operate this way because everyone was really united behind a common goal of improving public health. So as long as the human goals are kind of clear for the sorts of research people are doing, that will make all of these processes, I think, a little bit easier and it will make it more easy to be inclusive. So if you think about something like pathogenic Neisseria, it strongly affects people in Africa. So reaching out to people in the, in the meningitis belt was really important because it was vital to make sure that those views were included. So, um, so thank you again for including me and I'm interested to hear what the final word on the panel will be. Thank you, Eliza. And next, I would like to ask Hasib to share the concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been an excellent uh, discussion that we had, a dialogue. Uh, but I would like to end with uh, what I said at the beginning. Uh, uh, there are so many different aspects of uh, inequity and uh, uh, injustice in publishing industry. And the most prominent one is peer review system. Uh, we, I have already, we have already talked about so many different models, but none of those models actually reducing that inequity because it is at the end, it is increasing the workload of the reviewers in the name of equity. I would like to call it the burden of equity. So we want to have equity. That's why we are getting more burden. The reason is all the models are based upon altruism of the reviewers. We are just capitalizing on that. Since the whole system is built on that, you cannot have equity at the end of the day. You have something else. So my uh, proposition would be, why don't we reduce that burden? We can share, we can interact in so many different ways. Peer review is not the only way we can create a society uh, without peer review. When we publish a paper without peer review and have post peer review, so we are doing it. So my final uh, proposition would be, our industry, which has got some of the uh, publishing houses, a staggering profit margin, more than Amazon, Google, and Apple, can't they, can't that system invest enough to reduce the burden of those people who are we calling uh, reviewer because the whole industry is kind of based up on their altruism. We need to think about it. We need to think about it. Thank you, Hasib. Um, now, as for our last panelist, I would like to call for Faye Gao for share her concluding remarks. Uh, so thank you, everyone. It's still, I'm, I, I have to say this, that I've been learning a lot from just uh, your presentations and, and uh, just uh, the topics that you are giving tonight and this fantastic uh, panel discussion. I think this would be before this discussion. I'm a little bit sensitive about the AI assistant or the AI supported just uh, when we were doing in the scholarly publishing. But now I'm not, uh, I'm a little bit to the open side or at least I'm in the middle just uh, placed for this AI. I think just uh, before I'm worried about uh, the data security and privacy, just how we can handle those issues. And then now I think just, uh, I'm not the expert uh, in uh, also in, in either the, the just uh, the artificial intelligence or, or the machine learning or just computer science. But I think that some experts may may, may just uh, sort of the, the way and uh, combine with the, the more just the ethical and the legal standards for we were just introducing the AI solution to the peer review process, it's we, it's the destination, it's the destination, and the, that that that's the we we can now completely see no. We had to just more just welcome to the new technology, to the new tools, and uh, so I'm open to see just what's going on when more just the journals and more just the community uh, to. Uh, to just uh, involving the AI solutions to in the, not only in the peer review process, but probably in the other process, like just a production, 
uh, the editorial and in the whole just the, uh, the publication process. So I'm open attitude to this one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pegao, and all of the other panelists for sharing their opinions, their views, and the concluding remarks. Just like uh, we are debating that peer review is something uh, that is a thankless job and there is no reward in it and uh, no recognition in it, just same implies to uh, such sort of panel discussions and activities that we all volunteer. So from the whole ACAC team and ACAC platform, I would like to thank all of you for taking out this time of one hour and 45 minutes for this discussion and we will try our very best to somehow give you back for this one hour and 45 minutes recognition through um, recognizing and taking the notes of this panel discussion and contributing real part to peer review week rather than just um, going through one two or three sessions so we have so much uh, in points of discussion today from all of the panelists um, considering the policy making and then complete uh, more human approach to peer review versus um, complete AI assisted peer review and then how we can produce a more recognition to reviewers and how we can facilitate peer review. So we will hopefully add all these points referring to all of the contribution of your panelists in uh, the documentation afterwards for publication so that this effort and uh, the time that we spend e uh, today um, for this panel discussion, it's worthwhile. So thank you once again to all of you for taking out the time and sharing your opinion with us. And uh, this will surely be count as a productive and I would say constructive uh, contribution from AC CSC to Peer Review Week 2023. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariam. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.